everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. And it's me, Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. Wow, like like the famous actress Jack Hay with, with multiple Jack Hays? Yeah, that's my new name for 2021. Jack Hay, Jack Hay, Jack Hay. <laughs> Oh boy, well gotta, that's great. I gotta keep it interesting. Yeah, you gotta keep changing <laughs> keep, it up. People keep it get, humble. Yeah. You know, I, I find that to be true about a lot of things in, in life and in history. They start one way and then they get bored and you're like, you know, we gotta change it up. Mm-hmm. Change it all the way up. And you know what? Even though sometimes our segues or our beginnings are unrelated to our topic on our <laughs> show about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, I think this one's actually apt because yep. what we'll be talking about, oh, we, you know what, you actually pound? It's fun. Listeners at home, I got a, a fake pound from Jackie. We actually are going to be talking about how things change. And the more they change, maybe the more they stay the same, but not really. They actually change a lot. (laughs) And we're going to be talking about the history and evolution of the functional analysis. And since that's an area that we know a little bit about, because we certainly have been practicing for a long time, of course, we know about functional analyses. It's not something we know everything there is to know about. So we call the guest who does know everything there ever was to know about it. I believe she said that right before we started. Every single possible thing. (laughs) And that is Dr. Jessica Slayton. Jessica, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. You know every single thing there ever was and will be about functional analyses. So we're so glad you're here. So we're going to ask you lots of questions all about it. That is quite a big claim to live up to. <laughs> right? <laughs> Very daunting. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm going overboard a little bit. You know, I want to get y'all pumped up, though, ready to go. <laughs> Don't worry, I played Eye of the Tiger before you guys got on. Yeah, we had a whole oh, montage, perfect. you know, <laughs> looking at old PowerPoint slides and research papers. It's very exciting. So Jessica, before we get started on talking about, you know, the articles that we'll be discussing tonight, why don't you just talk to the listeners a little bit about who you are? As you have just introduced me, I'm Dr. Jessica Slayton, and I am the Director of Applied Research at Neshoba Learning Group, which is a day school for kids with autism in Massachusetts. So a lot of the work that I do with my teams there focuses on assessing and treating severe problem behavior of our students. So teams come to me with questions about how to assess this particular behavior, how to put together a treatment. And as I collaborate with those teams, we also try to do that in a a way that's systematic enough that we can then share that research with the field as well. So in terms of learning about functional analyses, I kind of want the story to be, but you'll tell me if it's accurate, that you were actually doing a functional analysis or or you were working on one with maybe some of your other staff members and and you're you're doing it, it's going all right. But you know, when you're done, you're looking at the data or you're scoring the tape, you you had that moment where you looked up and you just said, there's got to be a better way. And then you decided to look into the whole thing. Am I right? Is that exactly what happened? It's genuinely pretty close to what happened. So (laughs) very well predicted. (laughs) <laughs> the evolution within our organization for functional analyses kind of started as we wanted to be doing more functional analyses. We felt as practitioners that we were had been relying too much on some of our descriptive data, and there's plenty of studies out there showing that descriptive data won't necessarily match up to the outcome of a functional analysis. So we wanted to incorporate the, them more into our practice. And one of the things we actually did first to he- kind of help us make this transition was we first had Dr. Iwata come and visit us a few times and and do some training with us and take a look at at some of our cases. And that was very informative. And then after those visits, we started conducting the kind of traditional format of functional analyses with your attention, escape, tangible, alone or ignore sessions. And it went okay. We definitely ran into cases where we just weren't quite sure exactly what the data were trying to tell us, or or they looked undifferentiated, or we were seeing responses that didn't seem to match the data. So for example, you know, seeing a student in the alone condition, engaging in behavior, attempting to leave the room, clearly trying to get out and get to us, but it's occurring in the alone condition, and so it gets scored in the alone condition, and the analysis comes back looking like this behavior is, is automatic. But standing there watching it, you're like, I can tell he is trying to get out of the room and come to me because I have the iPad or whatever it is. So things like that that made us think about, is there a way that we could be setting this up that would be more informative and and 
get us results that are clearer, where we're not, you know, having four people staring at a graph going, oof, I'm not sure. That's got to be an all too common practice. You know, we spend so much time in supervision learning about behavior assessment, and then you run them long enough, and you feel like half of the things you learn is like, well, did it really mean this? Or am I just making up a story based on what I think has been in the research and what I think I saw or what I believe it, you know, the the trend was, and you know, and like you said, you know, just looking at the graph versus the the tape that you just scored, where it just doesn't seem to jive. You know, the two results you're getting. Yeah, and yeah, so that was it was somewhat hard too for then us to, in cases like that, get buy in from the rest of the team who are expected to implement a treatment when they, you know, weren't convinced that, that the graph from the analysis was leading us down the the path that we were suggesting we go down. Is that something that kind of led to some of your, your later research and your, and your continuing work was just, what are we going to do to make this process smoother, faster? Yeah, I think so. The efficiency was a concern, too. Cause the way that our schedule was set up is, our, you know, our staff are with students for two hour blocks and we have a number of BCBAs available. We all oversee a caseload. So, you know, if we had, let's say, a, t- a two hour block where I was available to come help implement the analysis. You know, if you didn't get through enough sessions, then that's another two hour block that we needed to come back and schedule and do more sessions. So getting through the analyses was taking multiple iterations of these two hour blocks. And that gets, you know, hard to account for just in terms of having the staffing and having BCBA availability Mm -hmm. to keep doing that. I can see that happening. Yeah. You know, like we would be emailing the people who handle our scheduling and saying, I know we've already asked for, you know, this many hours. Could you please get me in there for two or more? Because we think we need a couple more sessions. You know, it was it was a lot to juggle and we're willing to do whatever is necessary. But if there's something out there that would get that process done more efficiently and still give us the information we need to design an effective treatment, then of course we'd be interested in that. And just when you would see sort of the survey research out there kind of looking at how often do BCBAs do functional analyses and you'd see these, you know, these low numbers about like, well, you know, like 60 yeah, 60- ish percent do maybe you know like the descriptive assessments but eh, you know you're, you're you're really looking at chance levels that uh, bcba would always do a functional analysis i mean were you surprised when you read those results or you're sort of like yeah no that makes sense i think so i first i first read those survey studies probably around the same time that we started doing more functional analyses and i think my reaction was like yeah i get it i can i can see why people are concerned that it takes too much time it takes too much resources or that they don't have the training necessary because once they go through and do the analysis, if the graph isn't crystal clear, you know, you need to apply an interpretation or make some modifications. And, you know, there's not necessarily a lot of training unless you go and seek it out on exactly what, how do you modify an FA? What do you do when the, the data aren't clear? One article I really like that I have in my class for that is the Hanley 2012 article about the myths of functional analyses. And they have like 12 steps where they're like, all of these things, people say we can't run FAs because of, and then they provide uh, solutions for that. So I think if, if anyone is, is running across that, that's a really good article to read and then utilize. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was almost one of the ones I suggested we discuss today because it's just full of so many resources and just kind of goes point by point about each concern and exactly how it can be addressed. I think it's a, uh, really helpful article. And speaking of articles, you know, when we talk about the history and evolution of functional analysis, we could have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of articles, but you were very kind and sent us just four that <laughs> I think captured <laughs> kind of one aspect of sort of the, the evolution piece of the functional analysis. You know, how can we respond to how difficult at times running in a functional analysis can be, how interpreting the results can be challenging, and sort of what can be done to make the process more efficient, more effective, so that more people are using it consistently with meaningful results. Because again, just doing it a functional analysis where you're like, I don't know what to do with this graph. I guess I'll just throw a DRO on it isn't really you know, good use of time. You know it because I hate <laughs> DROs. Somebody sent me a graph the other day with DROs and I almost wrote them back. Like, you know what? My friend would hate this graph. So I also <laughs> won't accept it. Send me a better one. <laughs> I, I went, as an aside, we were talking about FA treatments and Someone said, well, we should probably just do a DRO in my class. And I was like, as an aside, to Get out, fair, get out. <laughs> that's what I thought you were going to say, get out. <laughs> and then I spent 15 minutes talking about why DRO shouldn't be your treatment of choice. But it was hilarious that I just was like, here's an aside, everyone. Right? 
So are you the professor if the kids are like, oh no, we've got a quiz. Quick, someone say something nice about DROs. And she'll just be on a tangent. <laughs> Oh, no, don't worry. I already have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are we talking about? Oh, articles. What articles did, yeah, not <laughs> did Dr. Slayton send us? No DRO articles here. Nope. So we've got, I'm going to do these in almost fully chronological order because we're talking about history. So first, identification of environmental determinants of behavior disorders through functional analysis of precursor behaviors by Smith and Churchill from Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2002. Response latency is an index of response strength during functional analyses of problem behavior by Thomas and Sassy, Iwata, Nadert, and Roscoe, also from Java from 2011. I'm going to switch the timelines a little bit here. Toward accurate inferences of response class membership by Warner, Hanley, Landa, Ruppel, Rajaraman, and Guy Amagami, and Slayton, and Gover from the <laughs> Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2020. And, oh, look, who's the first author on this one? Why, it's Slayton and Hanley, Nature and Scope of Synthesis and Functional Analysis and Treatment of Problem Behavior, also from Java, from 2018. Huzzah! Four articles. So we're going to be talking about, you know, the near distant past and then we'll ending with the future. But why don't we start with the far back, the far long, long ago? So, Jess, would you mind giving us, you know, in terms of looking at history, just a very brief kind of prehistory discussion of the functional analysis. So from like, how did the early cavemen run their functional analyses till, you know, kind of what we think of as the modern functional analysis? Sure, I can certainly try to describe all of that. <laughs> <laughs> In a brief 10 seconds, please. We've got about an hour-ish total. And we want to get to your article, so it doesn't need to be very long. <laughs> okay. So the, the seminal article that described functional analysis methodology that I think is probably most cited was that article by Iwata and colleagues that was first published in 1982, and then it was reprinted in Java in 1994. And so that, I think, kind of, like 1994 is kind of like an important point because that sort of initiated, I think, a lot of, a lot of articles looking at variations to those original procedures that described, you know, your standard attention condition, demand condition, ignore condition. And I mean, some of the variations that have been in the literature since then, starting, you know, in the, in the early 90s, you know, and coming along to the mid 2000s are things like the brief FA, where you're running just one session of each condition. I think sometimes people think brief FA means that you're doing a whole FA, you're just doing it real fast. <laughs> Come on, kid. Let's go. Let's go. Hurry, 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 yeah, go. yeah. Let's do like a one minute. But no, it means that you're presenting those conditions, but you're doing one session of each condition. And the brief FO is Northrop 1991, right? Yeah, Northrop 1991. Just in case anyone's like taking tallies. There's the trial based FA. I think one of the earliest reports of that was from 1995. So that's an arrangement where rather than setting up sessions in a multi element design, you're embedding trials of the different conditions throughout the day as the opportunity naturally arises. One of my favorites. It can be a nice way to sneak things in, so to speak, mm -hmm. if you aren't able to take all of this time to run sessions. One of the downsides, though, is that, you know, it can end up taking many days anyway because you need enough opportunities to get in enough trials of each condition. Mm. Right. I also like the author's names. Sigafoos and Saggers. Oh, no, yes. It's just like, I like wannabe. <laughs> it's like a magician act. Every time I see that sighted, I'm like, was that like a Lord of the Rings reference? Yeah. I don't remember that <laughs> one. But I think, oh, okay, not <laughs> We should all change our names to be more. Wizardry. Yeah, mine's so boring. <laughs> uh, also, Sarah Beth Bloom's work more 2011. recently. 2011. Yeah. Yep. On the trial base is excellent. Yeah, that's also a, another great example of, of conducting trial based functional analyses. There is also the latency functional analysis. So that's one of the articles I suggest that we talk about for this week by Thomas and Sassy. That came out in 2011, and that described a format where in every session, the latency to the first instance of problem behavior was measured. That instance was reinforced, and then the session was terminated so that you're not having repeated instances. So I guess long story short to answer your question, since that original Iwata article, there have been so many developments in terms of how conditions are presented, how often they're presented, what response you're measuring, whether you're presenting it in a multi-element or embedded throughout the day, whether you're reinforcing only dangerous behavior or precursors, lots of variations there. And then obviously whether or not you choose to combine or synthesize 
antecedents and consequences within a condition. And when you look back at some of the research, is there sort of a time frame of functional analysis methodology research that you you know think of fondly? I mean, I would assume <laughs> probably some of the synthesized you know assessment. We're sort of in the era of the synthesized <clears throat> FA right now, and and I would assume you know given when you you know did your dissertation and when you've been you know doing more of your research that it might be now. But I mean, is there one that you're sort of nostalgic for <laughs> when you look back at the research? I don't know that nostalgic would be the word to capture it, but I, I do remember as I was going through and, you know, doing, conducting the research for the review paper that we did on synthesis, it, it was really neat to look back and identify some of those early components and the way that people talked about them. So, you know, for example, there's this study by Bowman and colleagues from 1997, where it's called on like on the relation of man's and destructive behavior or something like that. That's a good one. Oh, I love that article. And they they introduced, I remember reading it in grad school for the first time, and it introduced the idea that compliance with man's could be a reinforcer for problem behavior. And I thought it was so brilliant. It was so informative. And it helped me as a young grad student recognize that, you know, we have like the big four functions, you know, escape, attention, tangible, automatic, or sensory, however people choose to describe it. But something like compliance with man's as a reinforcer for problem behavior doesn't really fit neatly into mm-hmm. exactly one of those categories. So I, I remember reading that in grad school and, and recognizing that reinforcers for problem behavior can be more nuanced than that. I don't know, I guess in the 90s, there were a lot of those cool, like, here's a reinforcer for problem behavior that maybe you hadn't thought about articles, mm-hmm. like the yeah. interruption analyses and into, you know, termination of do and don't request or going mm-hmm. back to a previous ongoing activity that you've interrupted, things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The article I just reviewed for our grab bag episode was on escape from conversations as mm-hmm. a reinforcer, which I really uh, associated with that one. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to say what you really identified with. I mean, we could all at some time. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant to yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now that we've, we've done the very brief very brief history review. Let's talk a little bit about where we are as a field and what research can tell us about kind of that evolution. So how can we get to the goal of developing meaningful function-based treatments, effective function-based treatments quickly, safely, and efficiently? And so why don't we start sort of with the, I'd kind of lump them in the, you know, the way I'd set up my notes and the questions, but we can certainly spread out from that. The Smith and Churchill on looking at precursor behaviors and with Thomas and Sassy on latency is sort of two examples of kind of those earlier, kind of the earlier research, those were the pre-synthesis and kind of functional analysis research. I'm so glad you picked these because I'm a huge fan of using latency whenever I can. Like, I think I've just gotten in the habit of always measuring latency when I do an FA, even if I don't have to, or I don't know if I'm going to use it. And then precursors, I mean, even I think with the synthesized analysis, when you have precursors, I just feel like when I get to that question of like, does anything happen before the really, really dangerous SIB? Why, yes, there is, Rob. Like, oh, thank God. Right, right. I nominated the the precursor and the latency articles because I thought they were like, those are two solid strategies that I think can, can help address the fact that practitioners aren't often conducting functional analyses they get right at the heart of it's too dangerous or it takes too long. So I, I thought they were really nice examples of how these like techniques to make functional analysis safer and for the sessions to take less time. These have been around in the literature for decades, but unfortunately we know people still aren't applying them as often as they could or should be in practice. So, I mean, I think in talking about, let's say the, the Smith and Churchill, so sort of looking at precursor behaviors, the concept probably isn't very surprising to anyone who's been practicing for any period of time in that, well, I mean, I don't really want to do an FA on SIB. There's real risk of danger. I have to set up an individual. I have to, you know, set up the environment so that they engage in SIB. I have to reinforce SIBs. You know, a lot of parents hear about that when they're you know talking about assessment options. They say, why would you want more SIB? Didn't I hire you to decrease SIB? And now you're telling me you need to see as much of it as you can. No, thank you. But the idea of, oh, well, what if I assess something a different behavior that occurred before SIB, won't that just work exactly the same? Which makes sense. But again, it's one of those things, I'm sure whoever thought of it first said, well, yeah, may, maybe it works that way, but who knows until you do the research. Right. Well, it has to be part of the same response. Path. And you would assume it would be, but that's a big assumption. And I you know love what they, making assumptions. You know what they say about assumptions <laughs> in your research, Diana. I was actually trying that's to what, That's the first thing you do in science. 
right? <laughs> Assume. It tends to just work out great and just do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> when you read Smith and Churchill, I mean, do you find that to be kind of a nice, thorough, stepwise process to say, here you go, precursors, go for it, kids, you got it? I mean, one of the reasons I like this article so much is kind of like you said, Rob, it's easy to to look at a behavior and make the assumption that these always happen together. Can't I just assume that, you know, assume that they all function as part of the same response class, but they went and put in the time and effort to ask that question empirically and gather the information. And I also appreciated, so in their discussion, they talk about the fact that they chose precursors just based on verbal reports, you know, from, from people who know the individual as well. And I thought that was really interesting. They also comment that there's more systematic research needed for how how to identify precursor behaviors. And so some of those articles have been published since. But I thought it was also really interesting that they were able to show that for all of their participants, precursors serve the same function as dangerous behavior, even when those precursors were just based identified based on verbal reports. So I think that's handy to know that like there are analyses out there you can do, like you can do a conditional probability analysis to figure out the likelihood of a certain response occurring immediately before or immediately after another response. You can you can do that and identify precursors that way. But it's also nice to have an example showing that you can identify precursors based on verbal reports and have those precursors serve the same function. And a lot of the times we're not going to have a lot of time to do potentially a conditional probability, right? So we might have some ABC data, we might have descriptive assessments, but they're like, we need it now. That's when you ask Jason Bure. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes those analyses like that can can be a luxury. And also if it's, you know, if the reason that you're doing a, so like sometimes we have really, really dangerous behavior, but it's low rate. And in that case, mm-hmm. observing enough precursor responses to do a conditional probability analysis, you know, it could take you a month or two months if it's something that happens, you know, like a severe outburst that happens once a week and is highly dangerous you know, the, the, the time it would take to do that an analysis first, mm-hmm. right. I think would be wasted when you could say, all right, let's, let's go with the verbal report of this precursor and move forward in designing our analysis. I enjoy the study in, in its simplicity. Like you said, Jess, what, what they're doing is, hey, are there other precursors? You know, there's an interview with the parents. What other precursors are there? You do a functional analysis on the, you know, original target behavior, the more dangerous behaviors, you know, the, the SIB aggression. And then you do an FA on precursor behaviors that have been reported to, you know, to occur before the SIB and aggression, and you compare your graphs. And lo and behold, they had the same functions, or, or the, the researcher said, yep, looks like the same functions just based on my visual interpretation of the graph. So I guess that's, you know, that's what you need to know about precursors. They seem to be part of the same response class, you know. For these participants. For these right. participants. For Again, the it's one study, yeah. but it's 2002. So we, you know, maybe yeah. we can speak a little bit more to the generality of these results since then. Well, and that's what was has been so interesting is since 2002, there's been a, a ton more of articles evaluating whether precursor responses match the function of dangerous problem behavior. And the answer is always yes. There's, there's so many more now. I mean, I, I could have mm-hmm. given you like a 10 just on answering that question. Do precursors tend to match the function of dangerous problem behavior? So we do have a lot more now since 2002. I like this study a lot for the reason that you just said, Jess, is that it can decrease the safety concerns around functional analyses, right? But I also like it because to me, it gets at the heart of what you're doing with the functional analysis. And this is something I like to bring up to my students when we talk about reinforcer assessments. Right? We, we talk, learn about preference assessments and we learn about reinforcer assessments. And I say, what's another example of a reinforcer assessment that you guys already know about? And they have no idea. Right. And I say, it's an FA. Yeah. <laughs> it's a functional analysis. Like that's what you're doing here, right? You're providing an opportunity to contact a reinforcer and then you're looking to see, you know, under what conditions this behavior occur when a certain reinforcer is provided. And that's exactly what a reinforcer assessment is. So the beauty of this type of study where you're hopefully not going to have the really dangerous behavior occur is that you're providing that reinforcer for another behavior, but you're still doing the same thing. You're still testing to see if that consequence functions as a reinforcer. You're just changing what behavior produces the reinforcer. Yeah. Still serving that same outcome of identifying the reinforcer. Yeah. So what a simple approach. And then there's another, there are other studies as well that 
don't use precursor behavior, but uses another arbitrary response to get at the same end goal too, which is also pretty beautiful. Yeah, some of those are my favorite too. See, I had such a hard time just picking four articles. There were like right? <laughs> I know. that I wanted to send you. Yeah, the, yeah. The, there are studies where they look at using a totally arbitrary response, like stuffing envelopes, you know, different colored mm-hmm. envelopes as a stand-in for the problem behavior. Because that's all you need to know, right? What functions is a reinforcer here? Like what floats this person's vote so that we can get it to them in the best way? Mm. Right, in the most appropriate way, yeah. Just while we had you, I had a, a quick question on, on Smith and Churchill's kind of functional analysis. I think I know the answer, but since you've done so much either research and review of the synthesized contingency analyses, I thought I would ask, would Smith and Churchill's FA on the precursors potentially be considered a synthesized FA? And I would assume not because they weren't looking at sort of all the potential topographies of problem behavior, but it did sort of have some of that same component that you see in a lot of the synthesized you know, FAs in terms of looking at precursors and looking at the primary problem behavior and looking at other sort of different topography behaviors that occur in the same cl- cluster timeframes? That is a good question. So I would look at this and say no. And first of all, there, like, there's so many different things that you could synthesize. Like people have synthesized the antecedents in a functional analysis, synthesized mm-hmm. topographies, meaning you're reinforcing multiple topographies or synthesizing consequences. In this case, they weren't in. They weren't combining antecedents. They weren't combining consequences. So those were singular. For the topographies, so in the first condition, when they placed contingencies only on SIB, they measured the precursors, but they didn't synthesize them in the sense that the contingency was applied to all of those topographies. And then when they put the contingency on the precursor behavior, they didn't reinforce the SIB, which for most participants they saw they didn't really see many instances of it anyway. But in that case, the contingency was still only placed just on precursors and not also on dangerous behavior. I don't know that I would call it a a synthesis of topographies, although I think we'd have to also go back and check, you know, which, like, did they report four different topographies of precursors for a Mm -hmm. participant? And and then you can start splitting hairs. Like, if there's four different forms of aggression, are we calling that synthesized topographies because I reinforced hitting and kicking and scratching? Or is that just all called aggression? I don't think so. I think they, there was one. Yeah, they picked one. I think they, they listed a few yeah, in one of their tables, but one. they only picked the one. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank, okay. That, yeah, thank I'm you like just... scrolling, scrolling through the yeah. methods here yeah. to remind myself. <laughs> Overall, I would say, no, this, to, to me, this doesn't represent synthesized analysis because I don't think any of the, the three components of a contingency the antecedent, the you know, response or consequence were synthesized. I appreciate you too, doing the thought exercise there because it popped in my head and I said, you know what? Even if I think I have an answer, if I've got someone who knows more than I do about this stuff, better ask them when you get the chance. I got to mo- model that for all the students who are listening out there. It's okay to keep asking questions. Absolutely. Oh, then I sound like one of those internet trolls. I'm just asking questions. You're just asking questions. <laughs> I just want to ah. know. You're badgering the witness. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's scientific knowledge. It's all I'm looking for, folks. All right, well, why don't we move on to Thomas and Sassy? And I know we were talking a little bit ago about using an FA as a reinforcer assessment and picking kind of an arbitrary response. And hey, isn't that what they did in experiment one of Thomas and Sassy for looking at latency as measures of latency in FAs with their vocational tasks? So I think the purpose of that experiment was almost as like a, a proving ground for the fact that there is going to be a correlation between latency and response rate. And that when you have a really high response rate, you will see a really low latency. So I think it nicely demonstrated that, that like it's reasonable to use latency as a measure of, you know, as another measure of response strength, like standing in for response, right? Because look how nicely they correlate with each other. And certainly when we're talking about latency here, or at least Thomas and Sassy and colleagues were talking about latency in their research, the idea was looking at response rate poses another danger. You need to see so many instances of self-injurious behavior, so many instances of aggression, what if we just looked at latency from setting the stage for your FA condition to time to first instance of problem behavior and then said, call it a day, move on to the next condition and then repeat this a few times. And then would you still get similar results or would you still get you know, meaningful results from that versus looking at response rates, so that latency time? And there was research in the basic science to support that latency could be used as another way of not, not a measure of response strengths, but a corollary of response strength, maybe? Is that? They've titled it response latency as an index of response strength. 
Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. So, yes. That I. The, but that idea of you know is response <laughs> strength and latency. You know, what would they serve as an, an index? <laughs> <laughs> an index of it. You know, could we consider them the same thing in in layman's terms? Because I can't find my my the precise term I wrote somewhere. I, I guess that's why they had their three experiments here. I. I always wonder when you get those three experiment studies, do they do the first right. one no, and say, that's it. Well, it's like you want to do experiment do another three, one. but before yeah. you can do experiment three, you have to go work backwards so that right. you don't enter into experiment three with assumptions that someone's going to then knock down experiment <clears> you based on. Reviewer two. Reviewer two, <laughs> baby. <laughs> someone's going to reviewer two it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that's why you have to go backwards in time. Mm-hmm. Also, it was a really nice modeling of systematically approaching a research question yeah, in experiment mm-hmm. one yes. they verified that latency and response strength with these vocational tasks that they're correlated then in experiment two they looked at functional analyses that had already been conducted and they graphed the responses in terms of latency to first response each session to see if it would produce the same like if it would indicate the same function which for most of the participants it did and so in experiment three they went and actually ran that analysis and compared mm-hmm. the two. This is certainly an example, I think, when we have three experiments that they describe very well, too, exactly what each experiment's purpose is in the grand scheme. Because mm-hmm. again, can you, could they have just jumped ahead and done experiment three? I guess. But then all the other questions that we've just been talking about, like, well, there's some basic research to support your use of latency, but, you know, we don't really know that much about right. it. And if you'd just done experiment two, that would have been safe. But again, well, yeah, but you're using data that was already done as part of kind of a standard FA. How would you have known that latency works as a meaningful treatment? Because you're, you're taking this data from multiple, you know, repetitions of the contingency. Right. Like you can't mm-hmm. go back and make that, that exposure not have happened. Like you, you exactly. have to interpret the data in the context of, yeah, this is latency to the first response. But after that, this person got a ton more exposure to the contingency, which absolutely could have impacted the responding in the next session. Yeah, who, who needs a latency FA if you have to run as many trials as you would with you know, the standard FA? It's like, well, what's, why, why are you doing this one? It's like, is there a benefit anymore? And then you haven't, you know, saved your client from additional exposure mm-hmm. to the dangerous behavior either. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. If, that, if that's your intent with using the latency measure. I was very surprised at how much shorter you know, number of sessions, amount of time was required to find differentiated results with the latency FA versus kind of the standard FA. I think, I think what was the range? It took as few as sort of like two repetitions of the conditions. I think that was the shortest they said for one particular. Yeah, that was the shortest. Yeah. And I think 29 was their largest versus, I wrote it down here, for like the, kind of the standard FA, it took 28 was the smallest. So just a little smaller than the largest for the latency FA up to 398. Or there was one that was 779, but that, that feels like a bit of an outlier when you're based. Right. That's like you're adding it in here. You're like, ha, 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 the, the M is going to go up. It's like, don't, you know, you don't need to rub it in. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but then you think about time. Yeah. Right. Like the latency FA is what, like three minutes long or five minutes long. If the behavior doesn't occur. Yeah. Right. right. At right. most it's five minutes At long most. for that one condition. Right. right. But yeah. with the FA, it's always that long. So I think that's always a nice caveat. Mm-hmm. And if you're using, you know, say you're using 10 minute sessions and you end up with a total of, you know, 20, 29 sessions total, that's 290 minutes compared to, you know, potentially less than 10. Well, plus all the bathroom breaks and the walks in between. <laughs> right? yeah. and, and it own- can genuinely translate into like, uh, you know, on the graph, it's 290 total minutes of in session time. But that depending on how often the, partic- the individual is available, how often the BCBA is available, all of that, it could translate into weeks of session time. You know, no one ever wants to be on the other end of saying, yeah, sorry, it's a, sorry, therapist, I don't have that treatment yet. Don't worry, it's coming any day. I'll be done with the assessment. Then I got to write the treatment, right. <laughs> the function-based treatment from that as it. But I swear, it's going to be great when it's done. Just 500 more sessions to go. I know it. I have been in the position of staff, especially when we were like doing some of our research where we directly compared the ISCO, you know, with synthesized contingencies to the more traditional FA where therapists were asking, like, do I have to do this one again? How many more, you know, how many more times do we have to run this session? It can be hard when, when sessions are longer and, and you know, you, you're needing more repetitions to get a clear answer. I think it's important to remember, too, that, you know, utilize functional analysis in our field and we, with good reason, right? But it's always still just an assessment. As long as you're doing your FA, 
you are still in the first part <laughs> of any type of you know clinical benefit for your client because you haven't even gotten to the part where you're going to do something that's hopefully going to help the situation. You're still just trying to figure out the situation. So the longer that assessment period drags on, the longer you're leaving your client without any hopefully therapeutic benefit from being involved in service. So the quicker that can be done, the better for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important thing for people to remember. And it can be, be easy to get like lost in the weeds, so to speak, of yeah. like analyzing every single, like, well, we did the FA, but, you know, between session seven and 10, I saw this thing that I wasn't expecting. And I don't know if we should keep analyzing that, you know, like you could, you could go down that rabbit hole and get stuck yes. there forever and lose sight of the fact that the reason you're doing this is to develop a treatment like that is it so that so that one day this person will be someone who no longer has problem behavior well let's take a quick break we've kind of we talked about our precursors we've talked about latency again you know just measuring how long to the first problem behavior as two you know really quick ways to sort of speed up and make more efficient your fa procedure but after that break i think let's come back and discuss a way that might top both of these in terms of overall efficiency of analysis. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu, regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking with special guest, Dr. Jessica Slayton, all about the history and the evolution of the functional analysis. But before we bring our discussion up to the present day, I wanted to remind our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. And by listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. Just listen to the rest of the episode and go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get CEUs. That's G-E-T hyphen C-E-U-S. And just enter in the two secret code words that we've hidden in the episode. I'm going to give you the first one now. It is tennis, T-E-N-N-I-S. Tennis, it's the sport where you have two rackets and a ball, also a tennis ball, and you bounce them back and forth. Fun fact, some people (laughs) consider the first video game ever created to be Tennis for Two, which was created using an oscilloscope. Oh, I did not know anything. In 1955, yes. Wow. Speaking of history... (laughs) Isn't tennis always for two? Yes, I don't know why he called it that, but I guess you just couldn't <laughs> call it tennis. You gotta, you gotta brand it or something. It would later be called Pong. I prefer T for two and two for T. Well, that game was not successful. <laughs> no one has purchased it. It's not real. <laughs> okay. Tennis. All right, so we teased before the break, but we're coming up into the, fu- not the future. I was gonna say the future, but it's really just the present day. I put it in my notes, the synthesis era. So we are now gonna talk all about the current trend in the functional analysis, looking at the synthesized functional analysis, which I know we were sort of joking in the break of how old is old and, you know, what we would consider not that old. (laughs) Many young people would consider very old. But when we talk about synthesized FAs, I think we are talking about something that is not very old. Well, at least in terms of, you know, most of the research that gets discussed. So Jess, I'm just going to say, why don't you just talk the rest of the episode? Because you did an entire review of all of the articles related to synthesis that ever have been. Okay. I'm joking. Oh. We, we can talk back and forth too. But. <laughs> yes, please. Let's, let's do that. 
Well, it's interesting that you're talking about like how how old is old, how new is is this? You know, one of the things that we wanted to do in our review when we looked back at the use of synthesis in the literature was kind of to ask that question, like, is is this actually something that is completely new? Or is this something that people have been doing in different ways and we just never called it the same thing? And so it sounds like these are all, you know, just different un- unrelated methodologies, different unrelated articles. But and so when we started looking back and looked at synthesizing antecedents as well as synthesizing consequences, we found a lot of way, way earlier stuff. I think the earliest thing we identified was 1995. We also ended up identifying things even in like the 60s that didn't quite count based on the, you know, the criteria we had set for inclusion, but that were really interesting examples of how people have been combining things in functional analyses for, for quite a while. We should probably also talk a little bit about what synthesis in an FA would be. And, and certainly we have other episodes of our show where, you know, like we talked to Dr. Roger Raman about, you know, the, the ISCA itself and some of that research. But when we're talking about synthesis in an FA, you have a fabulous visual in your article in which you've got kind of the, the gradations, almost like the color spectrum of, of the functional analysis in terms of going all the way from sort of, you know, what we consider sort of a, a basic or isolated functional analysis in which we're looking at, you know, one EO, one one topography that's going to be reinforced all the way up to, you know, what you'd see in sort of like the full synthesized contingency analysis where you're combining your topographies, you're combining the reinforcers that are delivered. Would you mind sort of describing that visual just kind of generally for folks who either are in their car and can't look at it right now or haven't gotten to their printer yet to look at their copy of the article? Sure, sure. Sorry, talk about old, their printer, (laughs) their phone to look at the article. (laughs) What's a printer? There's Xerox. Right. So if you're in your car, definitely do not try to look at this visual right now. But <laughs> It's a really it, good visual, everybody, but it, you, you should drive first. So, yeah, this dis- displays the continuum of things that could be synthesized or isolated. So we started by thinking about the parts of the contingency that are present in an, in an FA. So in, you know, in a test condition, you're presenting some EO that is going to evoke the target behavior. There's some target behavior that's going to be reinforced, and then you're providing some reinforcer. So you've got those three components, the EO, the response, and the reinforcer. And any of those or all of them could be either isolated or synthesized. So at one end of the continuum, you could have an analysis where in your test condition, there is one single EO being presented, like demands. There is one topography that is being reinforced, maybe, say, hitting. And there is one reinforcer that's being provided for that one topography, the escape from demands. All the way at the other end of the continuum, you could set up an analysis where in your test condition, you have synthesized EOs. So maybe, for example, you're withholding tangible items while presenting demands. Synthesized topographies, meaning maybe there's precursors and dangerous problem behavior that will be reinforced. And then also synthesized reinforcers in which you're going to provide the reinforcers associated with all of the EOs that you've put in place. So terminate the demands and return the tangible items. And then in between, you could have any combination. So you could have synthesized EOs and topographies, but only one reinforcer. So for example, maybe you're, that would look like you're withholding tangible items and presenting demands. But when the precursor or problem behavior occurs, you only terminate the demands but don't return the tangible item. So you've, you've provided one of the reinforcers in that you were setting with your EOs, but not all of them. In terms of the, the overall continuum, we're not supposed to be thinking about that as sort of, you know, topography is more isolated than, say, you know, the, the, the reinforcer being used, the response you know, being, being reinforced, right? It's more sort of just a matter of all isolated to some isolated to some synthesized to all synthesized correct? Or were you thinking of it as individual components sort of reflecting a more, you know, isolated FA viewpoint? I mean, that's a good question. I think that topographies are very often combined in functional analyses. So I I sometimes, I don't know, I don't know that, you know, if you had an FA where you had one EO, one reinforcer, but you you reinforce multiple problem behaviors, that that would necessarily be more synthesized than an FA where like you synthesized EOs, but you, you know, I, I'm not sure if I answered that very clearly. 
it sounds like there could be room for splitting hairs about, well, you know, this this component of an FA could be considered more isolated than synthesized, but perhaps not. It, it's not really a relevant conversation to have. I just sort of, anytime I see a continuum, I always wonder, is this sort of, are there components of it that are sort of arbitrary in terms of where they fall on the continuum? Or am I meant to take this as, you know, left is all, you know, is, is fully this direction of, you know, whatever the question is. And then. I, yeah. I, th- I think that you should read it more as just, this is, this is what exists and could happen. Like mm-hmm. you could have an FA where you've got a single EO, a single topography, a single reinforcer. You could have an FA where one thing is synthesized and the others aren't. It more just kind of describing what, what the possibilities are. I do think it's probably fair to say that synthesizing topographies probably has less of an impact on how you might interpret your results than synthesizing EOs or reinforcers. But that's not to say that it should be like disregarded. I mean, I think that's a good point. So I'm glad I asked the question because it is a good wrinkle in I think the overall view of our research. So in looking back, Jess, you mentioned that there, you know, would be research that, you know, could be tangentially related to, you know, the idea of synthesis in an FA back to the 60s. I mean, given that the functional analysis has been around for, you know, since the early 80s, I mean, were you surprised that you were seeing, you know, few examples of that type of synthesis until the 90s and then really not again as much until the, you know, later, later 2000s and then into the, the 2010s? Was there any sort of pattern you thought of as to why it was suddenly become such like a hot, a hot discussion at all the all the conferences you know, these past few years? You know, the the few examples that we identified, you know, in in the sixties and seventies, didn't end up quite meeting criteria, but they were interesting examples. So that's mm-hmm. you know, if you're looking at the graph and you're like, why is there not something from the nineteen sixties? That's why. But I wasn't really surprised to find some examples because at that point, the original Iwata article hadn't been published so there wasn't really a model for people to use as a template for a standard so it makes sense that people were kind of doing different things one of the things that i think has spurred obviously a lot of the current research on the use of synthesis in fas was that 2014 article by handley and colleagues where they first described this whole assessment and treatment process so there was a lot of replications born out of that so in you know when we were counting all the different applications there was a huge spike starting 2014 and and onwards, I think because of that. I have a question. Sure. Is there now, you know, in 2014 and, you know, 2014, 2016 era, we talked about FAs and specifically talked about the synthesized FA as the ISCA. And now it's, I've heard it more discussed as the synthesized FA. Is there a rationale for one name over, over the other? Are they synonymous? What should we be calling it? That is another great question. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of acronyms out there. So when I when I was doing my doctorate under Dr. Hanley, and we were talking about like the components of this FA that had been described, we the name ISCA came up because it kind of captured the key things that made it that. So it was interview and forms. That's the two eyes. The contingency was synthesized and it was an analysis. <laughs> so that's. <laughs> and and it was a word that you could pronounce because it had a vowel at the end. Yep. So Always that's helpful. where that's where that came out of. And then as as we did this review, you'll see, you know, we use the term in this review paper SCA, meaning synthesized mm-hmm. contingency analysis, because there's plenty of examples that weren't interview informed specifically. Also, you know, if someone isn't familiar with the acronym ISCA and exactly what it stands for, I find sometimes people may not be familiar with that, but they recognize the word synthesized. Right. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll say that just to, you know, for the benefit of the person that I'm speaking with, knowing that that will be more meaningful to them. Sure. I don't know that there's, at least in the language that I use, too much of a rationale beyond that. That actually helps, though, because I had a student ask, like, should I be calling it the ISCA or no? And I was like, well. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think you should call yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, the, I mean, in, like, in the articles that you'll, that you'll read about over the last couple of years, I think that is how it's described. Sometimes we describe it now as the the PFA, Practical mm-hmm. Functional Assessment, and that mm-hmm. kind of describes the, the whole process of the assessment, because the ISCA is the analysis part. Right. right. But mm-hmm. there's an interview, there's getting to know the client, building, building the rapport, designing the analysis. So there's also that process, and that could be important to describe as well. So in looking at the, you know, 
I mean, you knew that you were in for a big task, even if you were just looking at research published in, you know, the, the 2000s and the you know, 2014 spike afterwards. Did you have other kind of research questions you were looking for beyond just, you know, do we see a trend of the ISCA being an effective, you know, form of functional analysis? Were there other things that you were either hoping to see or, or you know, were then surprised to find in, in your final review? Yeah, I think it, it started from a genuine curiosity to investigate and describe what's present in the literature already. Because I, I know that one of one of the concerns with the use of the ISCA was that it just is so different from what people are used to and you know was was just it seemed like quite a leap from the traditional model. But it does have that kind of when you're describing it to someone like it's magic. It's just gonna it's really it's gonna take you 30 minutes. It's gonna be really great. And it's like I don't I don't know. I can't trust this. It's too new. Right. Well and and so yeah part of the purpose of the review was to really investigate to like we knew that the components that built up the ISCA were not just pulled out of thin air. These were like right. very carefully chosen over decades of, of research looking at individual components that are out there in the literature and kind of pulling best practices together to create this model. So also, I think one of the purposes also was just to identify the body of research from which we could start answering questions about, should you be using synthesis? Should you not? What are the benefits? What are the disadvantages? Because, you know, one of the points we make in the intro of this review is that so far, most of the articles that use synthesis didn't describe them as synthesized. So you could you can't do like a keyword search and get every single mm-hmm. example. So part of the issue in saying, okay, we have this new format of functional analysis and we want to investigate the extent, you know, in general, its outcomes, its risks, its benefits, et cetera. Those questions were hard to answer because we hadn't yet identified, well, what's the body of literature to which this is like from which this is drawn and to which this mm-hmm. speaks. So part of it was almost like literally trying to trying to define like what is what is it that falls under synthesis and what words have we used to describe it in the past and kind mm-hmm. of you know delineating the boundary of of that body of literature. Thank goodness for PhD students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this oh. was quite an undertaking. <laughs> I always so appreciate when authors and researchers go to the trouble of like, here are all the articles we started with <laughs> and here are all the articles we read <laughs> and here's all the analysis we did in reading those articles. I'm like, thank you so much. Cause I'll just read yours. And <laughs> I'll call it a day. <laughs> well, that's what's nice about reviews. It puts all of that information yeah. in one place. I love the table too. Of like, look at all the articles we did. It's like, mm, no, no, thanks. I'm, I'm not going to be looking at those. <laughs> right. your, right. your results look great. I'm fine. Glossy eyes over that one. <laughs> Yeah, um, following the Prisma process was really interesting learning process of how to, you know, document the search and everything that was included and why and everything that was yeah. excluded and why. I love reviews. I'm saying it again for the second week in a row. Mm-hmm. We need more reviews in our field. Well, I mean, I think especially when you're talking about, I mean, it's a bit of a tangent to our conversation here, but sure. I think when you're talking about trying to either, you know, discuss whether a field should adopt different methodologies or different procedures, right. or if you're trying to share with a field that isn't as familiar with your body of research, like, well, let's go back and talk about a WADA at all. And then we'll bring it up that, you know, you're going to get glossy eyes a lot faster than you are people in our field. So when you have documents like here, read these like three things, and they'll give you like a pretty good summary of sort of what's out there right now. I think it is it's such a powerful tool to dissemination. I do think this is really useful, the way you're talking about it, Jess, and that There is this history leading up to that 2014 paper and pulling all these pieces together because I think often people see it as we had the four condition Iwata FA and we used that for years. And then suddenly there was this entirely different being that arose (laughs) from the top of Greg Hanley's head. He he was trying (laughs) to hang a clock by the bathroom. He slipped and fell. When he woke, he invented time travel in the (laughs) ISCA. Right. And, and and I think, you know, people see it as like there's these two things that are, you know, undeniably opposed to one another and they're never the twain shall meet. But there are certainly times in which there's overlap between the two. And the, and the end goal is the same, <laughs> which is something I don't think we should lose sight of. The end goal is right. that we figure out how to turn behavior on and off and for what reasons. And then we teach necessary skills. Right. Yeah. To come up with a treatment that is going to effectively address that behavior and to do it as efficiently and safely as as possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it is very easy to lose 
to lose sight of that. And so, but that's also, I think, one of the areas where we need so much more research. There was, I almost suggested that we read Mashid Gayamagami's review as well, which just came out in 2020, maybe technically 2021, a review of FCT. I don't know if you've heard of that paper or had a chance to take a look, but what those authors yes. did is they went through and they did a review of like every single application of FCT and coded it for the extent to which it was done like by analysts in a really tightly controlled environment with, you know, a dense FR schedule versus, you know, all the way to the other end of the continuum of effectiveness done in, you know, the natural environment with implemented by caregivers, et cetera, all those things. And it just really nicely demonstrated that we don't have a lot of data on treatments for problem behavior that are towards that end of the continuum of effectiveness, where did this work in the person's typical environment when Mm -hmm. implemented by their caregivers under thin schedules of reinforcement that meet the natural needs of the environment with generalization, with maintenance, with, you know, like all of these things that you really want out of a treatment. We still can't say if you, if you truly want to eliminate problem behavior from an individual's life so that you know, in the future, they just do not have problem behavior and they're able to access whatever environments they want and do whatever it is that they would like to do. Here's the right way to do the FA to get you there. We, we mm-hmm. can't say that yet because that data on treatment just isn't there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. that's one of the huge kind of next gaps to address. It is so very true in terms of, you know, what is the end goal? Mm-hmm. And it's like, as fun as it is, and I'm sure as much fun as you had reading every, all these articles, and looking for, you know, the trends in, in the analysis, like you were saying, Diana, we do have to move on from the analysis and then talk about the effectiveness of treatment and yes. then not just the, hey, look at the graph. We had the next, you know, 10 days and then maybe we, we popped in for a few hours, you know, three months later. We do need to actually, you know, let people live their lives again with a meaningful, effective <laughs> function-based treatment. Just do you mind going over a couple of the kind of the patterns of the results you found? Because sure. I know for as many articles as you looked at, it was really neat to see that they sort of slotted into a couple, you know, I know they weren't exactly the same patterns, but but you were able to sort of categorize them as a couple, you know, different patterns of you know what you were seeing in terms of the results of the, you know, the review for for synthesis. Yeah, which which patterns do you think would be most helpful to talk about? Because we kind of like we described patterns in terms of what were people synthesizing, like were mm-hmm. they combining EOs and reinforcers, just EOs? We also talked about patterns in like where were these analyses occurring? you know, in, in homes versus schools. So, you know, we were on the subject of sort of talking about treatment effectiveness. So, mm-hmm. so why don't we kind of focus there for a couple of minutes, you know, in terms of where the treatment's effective, was the ISCA sure. or sorry, was the synthesized contingency analysis necessary to determine a function and kind of those bigger questions. To look at treatment efficacy, one of the things that we did was we imported a, a screenshot of every single treatment graph and used uh, like a digitizing program to, to lift the baseline data points and the final treatment data points so we could actually calculate the change in behavior, like the percent reduction from baseline mm-hmm. to the end of treatment. And then we're able to put that together and say, okay, across all of these examples of treatments that used some type of synthesis in terms of EOs or, re- or reinforcers, what was the percent reduction in problem behavior for each applicant. And there's a handful of studies where the authors directly compared some type of isolated treatment. So, a, you know, a treatment with isolated reinforcers directly compared to a treatment with synthesized reinforcers. So for those participants, we calculated the efficacy of both of the treatments. What was the percent reduction from baseline during the synthesized treatment? And what was the percent reduction in baseline from the, for the isolated treatment? In all of those cases, we found that the data reported for the synthesized treatment showed a much greater reduction in baseline. Now, obviously, in those articles, the reason that they reported both treatments is because the isolated treatment had failed first, and then they went mm-hmm. to the synthesized treatment. So right. that was not a surprising result. But it was it was interesting to note in all of those cases, there was never a case where the synthesized treatment failed, and so they went back to an isolated treatment. And then for the Rest of the comparisons, those were just examples of treatments that use synthesis, but there wasn't a direct comparison to an isolated treatment. So we couldn't determine whether the synthesized treatment was absolutely necessary and mm-hmm. like an isolated treatment wouldn't have worked. But what we could determine was that the synthesized treatment occurred and was very effective. 
So for most participants who had some type of synthesized treatment, the reduction in problem behavior was at least 80%. And for a large majority, it was over 90 or 95%. So mm-hmm. what we found in general was that the, when those treatments were applied, they were highly effective. We couldn't speak to whether an isolated treatment would have also been just as effective or more effective, but the synthesized treatments that were out there were effective. I mean, that kind of lends itself to the assessment itself, right? So, I mean, our goal is to develop treatments and the synthesized FA is one, one tool in the many tools that we could use depending on our expertise and depending on what we have, Mm -hmm. right? So I think Yet the synthesized FA may give us a result, but another one may also have given us a result, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're still looking for the same types of variables. Mm -hmm. And then, but then we'd be asking questions related to resources, right? What's the setting that's that's relevant? Absolutely, yeah. Efficiency. So another interesting thing we found was we we included articles where there was some type of synthesis in the treatment, even if the FA was isolated. We found a bunch of examples where the initial FA was just isolated. But then when they went on to treatment for some reason, they ended up needing to add synthesized reinforcers to the treatment. So that was interesting to see too, that there were sometimes cases where the isolated FA was really clear, but when they designed a treatment based on the outcome of that FA, they, it either didn't work or they didn't get as far as they wanted in terms of fading, and they had to add synthesized reinforcers to get the treatment effects they wanted. I found that very interesting to Jess, in terms of did any of the authors ever put that you can remember? I know it's been a while since we looked at all of these studies, but a rationale for that, because it feels like the purpose of doing the isolated FA and then developing a treatment would to say, here are the results of the isolated FA. Therefore, these are the treatments that would make the most sense in terms of looking at function, but to then have a treatment that, and then we threw a bunch of other stuff in there too, while we might all say, well, they, they must have gotten poor results with their treatment, that does feel sort of anathema to you know, the behavior analyst coming up with a function-based treatment of like, well, I got the function-based treatment and it didn't work. So now I'll just keep doing things until I get results. It it, it feels a little, feels like a little bit of an odd response. I mean, you, I know you're trying to come up with an effective treatment, but still you, you went to the trouble of doing the FA. So in some cases it was, you know, that the initial isolated FA was showed multiple control. So then they did an individual treatment for, you know, those, those different functions, but ended up having to combine them. Okay. To make it one effective treatment. And then I think something else that's discussed too is adding tangibles to an escape based treatment, where so maybe the FA is differentiated for escape as the reinforcer. During FCT, you provide escape, you know, contingent on some appropriate response. But sometimes people also end up adding tangibles during that escape interval. I've seen it kind of framed in the context of that adding tangibles can enhance the efficacy of. A, you know, treatment for escape maintain problem behavior. Mm-hmm. So that, I, that's one way to look at it, that escape treatments are sometimes more effective with arbitrary tangibles. Another way to look at it could be that the tangibles will, were always relevant. And for some reason, the initial isolated FA did not detect that contingency. It's, it's really difficult to prove which one is the case for any given individual. Sure. I want to make sure we do discuss at least briefly the Warner et al. 2020 study, which to me felt like both a kind of next step of your, you know, sort of your review and some of the research related to the synthesized contingency analyses, as well as kind of a revisit of the Smith and Churchill in terms of sort of looking at the precursors. So it did seem like a nice kind of dovetail of all the research articles that you recommended for for the episode. Yeah, I felt like it nicely brought together some of, you know, the things that were raised in this, the Smith article on precursors and one of the things we found in our review, which was that so at that point, most of the examples of synthesis we found also reported combining topographies. And that's common across all types of FAs, not just synthesized. You know, it's you know, reported in reviews of FAs like by Hanley in 2003 and Beavers and Iwata in 2013 that most people are combining topographies. But at the point of our review, no one had evaluated whether problem, but, you know, responses that tend to occur together serve the same function when evaluated within a synthesized contingency. So we have all of these articles indicating that co-occurring responses tend to serve the same function and precursors tend to serve the same functions as dangerous behavior in the more traditional isolated format where you're presenting one EO and presenting one reinforcer. But no one had taken a look at that in the context of the ISCA. So that's what these authors did. 
I always feel bad reading these articles in that there was just so much work put into the procedure, you know, doing the extinction analysis, mm-hmm. so which which must have taken a lot of time, a lot of thought. And then in the end, when they come to the conclusions, you're like, yes, precursors. Yep. Yep. Works the same way as before. You're sort of like, yeah, okay, great. I don't need to read this. I've got the Cliff Notes version. It seems to work just fine like I thought it would before based on, you know, older articles. But I, I don't want to give short shrifts to all the work that went into <laughs> demonstrating that point. You know, we don't just take it for granted because... We're assuming it, you know, it, it has to be demonstrated right. in, in the research. So could you sort of talk about that, that, that extinction analysis that they used in their procedures? That it was such a, such a, a very clear way, I think, to demonstrate or to answer the research question. Sure. Yeah. So these methods were modeled after an article by McGee and Ellis in 2000, where they used a, you know, sequential or progressive extinction. And so what the, the current authors did in the, the Warner et al. study They conducted the ISCA for 10 participants and then progressively applied extinction one by one to different topographies to determine the extent to which the frequency of that topography would change when it was when other topographies were removed from the from the response class. So, for example, if you are thinking that, you know, whining disruption and aggression are all part of the same response class, and you initially open the contingencies so that you're reinforcing any one of those responses, you may see only whining happen in the analysis because you provide reinforcement at that point, and so the individual doesn't escalate to disruption and aggression. Mm -hmm. If they're part of the same response class, if you were to continue sessions and remove whining from the contingency class, meaning apply extinction to whining, if the other two responses, disruption and aggression, are really part of the same response class, you would expect that at that point, you would see one of them increase. It's almost like playing like whack-a-mole, you know, like if you, mm. if you like whack one down, then whatever pops up next is probably a functionally equivalent response, because that's what happened when someone experiences extinction. They, you know, you get extinction-induced variability and you start seeing other responses that are in the same response class. So they went through progressively and did this and were able to show that for nine out of their 10 participants, when they put one topography on extinction, the next one popped up. When they put that topography on extinction, the next one popped up. And, you know, systematically showing that all of these topographies are, in fact, part of the same response class. One of the nine participants, they, they were able to demonstrate that very, very, you know, pretty clearly in, the, in, in their graphs. Yeah, there was one participant for whom it was ambiguous. And for the other nine, it was very clear. I love that word. Ambiguous mm-hmm. or clear? Ambiguous. Oh, I prefer clear just because it implies that, <laughs> yep, I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so precursors, they're still on the table for, for use in analysis, regardless of whether it's an isolated or synthesized. And co-occurring topographies of problem behavior. So not all of these were necessarily described as precursors. They were just mm-hmm. other topographies of problem behavior that tended to co-occur in an episode. That's a very good point. You know, when you're thinking about a tantrum being, I'm on the floor and I'm kicking and I'm screaming right. and I'm biting anyone who's nearby. Like, well, great, I don't need to be bitten to to have this analysis be considered effective. I mean, just right. focus on one of those others, maybe the whining part of it or the kicking yeah. feet, you know, up and down. And it's all to the end of having the most safe, efficient assessment that you can so that you can move past that mm-hmm. and get to the next phase. You know, one of the points that these authors made in their discussion was that they're not necessarily recommending that this is what practitioners do, like to do the extinction analysis every single time. Yeah, (laughs) they made made that very clear in the discussion. Like, please don't start doing this all the time. But yeah, they did. They did the heavy lifting to go through and answer the question of, you know, do precursors and co-occurring topographies of behavior like does does everything we know about them hold true even when you are evaluating them in a synthesized contingency? And for these participants, the answer was yes. So, But this also serves as a nice model. If for some reason, for an individual client, there is a real need to tease out the, the response class, so maybe it's been requested by a caregiver, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's some real need to do it, this is a model of how to do it quickly and safely. I think it also speaks to the preference for most individuals to engage in behavior that requires the least response effort in yeah. order to access the reinforcer. So. You know, if you have this opportunity to look at what probably hangs together as a response class, then pick a uh, appropriate alternative behavior that's least effortful yes. <laughs> in that series of responses, right? And so that responding will most likely allocate to that once it's been trained. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
And I think that's, this line of research is important too in terms of when you're trying to explain the reasoning for an assessment. Because if you have a family saying, I need you to help my you know, son or daughter, or, you know, the, the rates of aggression are too high. And you say, don't worry, we're going to do an assessment of like nose picking. You're like, well, that's not what I asked you to do. You, know, you can explain, right. well, you know, when, you, when you describe the behavior to me, you describe the topographies of behavior, you know, we did see the co-occurring. And so therefore... I can look at the, you know, like you said, the least, mm-hmm. the least unsafe, the least dangerous mm-hmm. problem behavior and get a meaningful result of the assessment. I don't know how often people's clients have said, mm, you know what, I've been reading about response classes so much and I would love to see, you know, proof that these are in the same response classes. But I suppose that could be a situation that could occur. So for the participant bill in this study, that was a participant that I worked with and, and the team had that question. He had this history of these different behaviors that... Mm-hmm. Sometimes they did occur together. Other times they occurred completely separately. And the team genuinely was baffled about like, should I be treating these behaviors the same? Or are they genuinely different? Like they genuinely wanted the answer because they were having trouble coming, Mm -hmm. coming up with a treatment and and just knowing if they should be responding to these behaviors as, as if they were equivalent. So that's exactly why, why we did this for him. And we were able to show really clearly they are in fact equivalent. That's a kind of a, test case that I was not even thinking of in, in looking at the research. So I pr- appreciate the boots on the ground <laughs> description there, Jess. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. They came to me and basically were like, I don't know. These just look like they're real different, but maybe mm-hmm. they're not. And so we said, well, okay, let's check. And now if someone has that question, they have a, maybe not an answer, but a means to get that answer too. They use three different types of the extinction kind of extinction analysis. And I should just, you probably know this. Was there a reason that the procedure used kept changing, you know, in terms of doing the full extinction analysis. And then there was the brief extinction analysis that just sort of develop over time. Or or were there different clients who just based on their needs, you couldn't do the same exact same analysis in terms of, you know, closing the the contingency? You know, I am not sure about that one, to be honest. I don't know, you know, I don't know if it arose from wanting to look at can can we get the same answer with an expedited analysis where we don't have to mm-hmm. go through five series of extinction to different responses? Mm-hmm. Like, I do remember, I think there were some discussions around that because say you have like six co-occurring topographies and you really you're most concerned about biting, for example. It would be much more efficient to, you know, do the initial analysis, look at all the responses you got, jump just to putting everything else on extinction except for biting to see if biting pops. And then go back rather than going through like this, you know, five step extinction process. But I can't, I can't speak to for any individual participant why they chose that particular form of the extinction analysis. Sure. Yeah. And these may have been conducted over a longer period mm-hmm. of time. I know I saw a version of these data many years ago. I don't know anymore if they were the same participants or a pilot version. And I talked about it for a long time. You're like, that was so cool. I hope I see those in print. Your someday. favorite anecdote at are. every <laughs> cocktail party we went to, Diana. But I saw lot. these data. Oh, it was so exciting. Yeah, I'm really fascinated with cocktail parties. And we said, wait, we said, where are they, Diana? Where, where are these data that, that yeah. you say I'm you just saw? Just in the bathroom at cocktail parties waiting for them to be over. <laughs> I know the really participant that I worked with, that was <laughs> before I, I graduated. So uh, 2015 or 2016, I think. I think. Yeah, I, I don't know how it was quite a few years ago that I saw some version of these data. Well, we we, be, we finally believed your crazy story, <laughs> Diana, about the data you saw. <laughs> they were this big. Yeah. I swear. It was really effective. Well, I think we should probably start wrapping up, which means it's time to move into the dissemination station. <laughs> I was looking. What is that? I was looking for the. Sorry, she just- <laughs> I was looking for my microphone. Jack. Jackie just she just turned her drink and started talking. <laughs> well, because usually my microphone is on this side of my computer, which is bad microphone technique to begin with. Right, and, I know. So I can make it now. But yes, I was moving. Do I cue you again? No. <laughs> I got this, this. Leave this all in for the listeners to yeah, enjoy. They'll also enjoy it. Low train today. <laughs> Oh, man, it looks like the little engine that could just pulled into the uh, dissemination <laughs> station here. Nightmare. <laughs> so, Jess, one of the things I noticed in reading, at least under the later articles that you suggested, is it does feel that there is a little bit more speed in terms of being able to turn research practice into common methodology. And, I mean, I might just be sort of jumping to conclusions based on 
the fact that a lot of times, you know, doing this podcast, most of the research, we, you know, we're either suggested by guests or that we choose to read and share with the listeners are kind of for that purpose of getting from the practice to the methodology. But I mean, is that a pattern that I'm just sort of making up on my own? Or have we gotten to a point with research related to functional analyses that we have so much data, so many results out there that it doesn't take as many replications to make a change in methodology? That is a good question. I'm not sure. You you asking like, are we are we at the point where we know enough now that that people are more easily convinced by fewer replications? Yeah, and I certainly I feel like some of the you know the research in terms of looking at the synthesized contingency assessments. A lot of times the researchers are doing either like the you know the case studies or they're looking at huge participant pools. So I mean, it may just be the way research is being designed is to get to you know meaningful methodology you know, quicker through better designed research. I mean, maybe that's the the trend, but you've just seen so many articles at this point have been been a part of so much of this research. I just didn't, you know, kind of didn't know if it, that thought had either popped into your mind or you had a similar thought at any point. You know, the, the research that I've done and what I've read most recently has made me much more interested in seeing studies that can speak to a larger impact and uh, generality across bigger participant samples, you know, effects of treatment maintained over time. So I would certainly hope that those are values shared by other researchers as as well in terms of saying, okay, we have we have a lot of these examples of of things on the, in the continuum towards efficacy, meaning we know they they work in really controlled settings and under certain circumstances. But what can we do to to generate research that helps us answer the question of to to what extent does this also work under more naturalistic situations with a much wider variety of participants, different profiles, et cetera. I don't know if that really answered the question that you were asking. I honestly think for me, when I know what you're asking, and for me, I think it's going to depend on right now, I think where you lie on the continuum, right? Because some people are like all for using synthesized update, right? There is a completely different camp that is not for using synthesized FD, right? So and <laughs> they're they, on that same continuum they, that Jess wrote in her article, right. I guess. And you know they they've published articles against the application of synthesized, FD, right. right? So mm-hmm. there's a few mm-hmm. out there. Mm-hmm. I think it's where you're looking and what you're. I mean, I agree that we're all doing. We're all trying to get where we're at, right? We're trying to find an effective assessment so that we can get to the outcome as as soon as possible, right? Some people might argue that synthesized FAs are a great assessment tool, but they don't identify the function, right? So then you might have an effective treatment now, but the treatment may not withhold later, right? right? And and other people are like, we haven't seen that, right, Mm. when we do it. But I think you have to kind of think about those two things, because I think not everyone's on the bandwagon, right? Right. And, And as a practitioner, I think it's important to look at what your needs are. What question you're trying to answer. What question you're asking. Yeah. You have to talk to your clients, right? You have to talk to the caregivers. It has to be a collaborative effort, right? And what do you value most about getting out of the assessment? Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's where I stand. And I did want to make the notation, mm-hmm. I guess, that not everyone is like, yay, synthesize FA, right? Mm-hmm. Right. There's mm-hmm. some people that are very much against it, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, I actually did have that conversation at a cocktail party. Yeah, me too. (laughs) Sounds delightful. Yeah, but, right, but I think as a practitioner, you you don't need to be part of that, right? It's like you don't have to be part of that mom's group on the block. (laughs) What you need to do is think about what's going to be best for your client Mm -hmm. and what the stakeholders and your clients are going to value. Yeah. And I think it's important, too, to recognize what... What questions have we answered or begun to answer and what questions have we not answered yet? Like, what is there not out there in the research yet? Which I think what I would like to see most answered is treatment effects over time. Because you're right, Jackie, maybe this, you know, there's a particular treatment that's effective with synthesized reinforcers, but for some reason fails over time. The same could be true of treatments based on isolated reinforcers, because in general, our treatment literature for either synthesized or isolated reinforcers just does not have enough examples showing that, you know, the way that it holds up over time. And I'm talking long periods of time, like really extended maintenance, 
generality yes. to all necessary environments, some of those measures, the, the data just aren't there. So it's kind of hard to, to, to say either way. Those are the data that, that I would like to see next. Mm-hmm. If someone out there wants to, you know, do that. Thesis! Mm-hmm. There are so many questions, you know, and Jess, you brought you know, a number up, Jackie, you brought a number up, that are going to have to go into any one particular choice of assessment or combined form of assessment. You know, as, as we talked about, we've got gradient. So you don't have to just run, say, the ISCA or an isolated FA. You could run something that's in between all of those. Or both of those, I should say. If you had kind of you know general recommendations beyond sort of making sure that we're paying attention to our clients' needs, if they're you know the stakeholders involved, making sure we're being clear about what's going to make sense. So beyond that, are there general methodologies regarding FAs that you like to share with either newer practitioners or practitioners who maybe were in that half of survey respondents and said, "I don't usually do an FA before." Slapping my DRO on the uh, <laughs> on the behavior intervention started. plan. Don't even get me started. <laughs> the four articles that I chose to talk about this evening kind of, I think, get at that question, which is that regardless of what methodology you use, I always recommend reinforcing precursor behaviors in addition to dangerous behaviors and co-occurring responses, because one, it'll likely keep you safer and keep your, your client safer. And there are enough studies showing that they serve the same function that we can be confident in saying, I, you know, including precursors, knowing that you have the option to use latency if you're worried about safety, danger, speed, I think is important. And then I think the other, the biggest thing I try to emphasize, especially like when I work directly with teams on the ground is that we need something that they can implement. And so designing from that question of what what information do I need so that I can turn this into a treatment that will work in the environment that it needs to work in. And that's where I found it to be really helpful to rely on synthesized contingencies that are currently in place in that environment, because I know if this is what's happening right now, I know I can make a treatment that will be implemented in this environment because I'm dealing with the exact same contingencies that are already in place. I'm just going to apply them to something appropriate. So making sure that what you're designing is going to meet the needs of the environment that it's meant to be done in. And if that is a synthesized contingency, then so be it. If it truly is not, then so be it. But you don't want to design something that can't even get off the ground because it doesn't match the environment or the people who need to do it. That's my goats, girl. (laughs) Well, we've talked about history. We've talked about the present of the FA. My last question for you, Jess, what's next for the evolution of the FA? Let's make wild (laughs) predictions about five years in the future. What will FA research and methodology look like? I think she already answered it. Well, we talked about what we want to know, but blue sky it. What will we see? I, I don't know. I really don't know. There's so many different branching lines of research now related to functional analysis. You know, like, like the synthesis for isolated is, is one component of FA research. I don't know that I have an answer to what it really would look like. I'm hoping we deal with treatment. That's, mm-hmm. that's right. my hope. I, I mean, I think all of us have probably worked with individuals long enough to, to know, know clients and know stories of you know kids that were five years old and engaging in headbanging and you turn around and they're 15 years old and still engaging in headbanging. Yes. Mm-hmm. I want us to solve that. I want that to no longer be the norm. Yeah, mm-hmm. mine too. Assessment and then how we can incorporate clients, more clients and, and stakeholders into the discussion of assessment and treatment. Absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. So we, we need to start tackling those anti ABA discussions, mm-hmm. right? And tackling them in a way that is like, okay, I hear you. Let's move our, our assessment and treatment to something that you find acceptable, right? Mm-hmm. Right. That's where I'm hoping we are at. We're looking at assessment because we're looking at treatment. It's a good point, too, because even if we were saying, you know, because my, my initial thought would be like, well, wouldn't it be great if we saw that people filled out the survey about do I do an FA? Like, hell yeah, 100 <laughs> percent. But at the end of the day, if everyone's doing an assessment and we're still getting the same sort right. of like mediocre treatment results mm-hmm. that, you know, sometimes right. I bet we, we all we all feel like we might be kind of in that, you know, the, the five to 15 year old, and we just haven't seen that change. Right. Who cares if everyone's doing an assessment? Who cares? Because it doesn't matter if you can't come up with the treatment that is going to have long-term meaningful change across settings. Fist, pump, bump, 
And I think we're all supposed to make a sad face. Like, oh, but we're not there yet. But maybe we're five years. We're not there yet. No. When we're doing FAs in space, we'll have the answer. <laughs> I call that research, everybody. So, you know, back off. I, I'm going to do that research one. Research in space. Zero G FAs. <laughs> Oh, well, that brings us to the end of the show. Jess, if folks want to reach out to to talk to you about like histories, or I, I know you have a lot of visuals that you like to use when you're sure. discussing FAs, is there a place they can contact you? Yeah, sure. They can, they can email me at my Neshoba Learning Group email address. It is jessica.slayton at neshobalearninggroup.org. Neshoba Learning Group is all one long word, dot org. That is that. We want to say another big, big thank you to Dr. Jessica Slayton for joining us on the show tonight. We also want to say thank you to all of you out there listening. If you would like to purchase CEs for this episode, remember, you need your second secret code word. I'll give that to you now. It is lilac, L-I-L-A-C, lilac, the flower or the scent, I suppose, that you might find that's based on the flower, (laughs) lilac. And with that, it brings us to the end of another episode of ABA Inside Track. We hope you enjoyed it. If you like the show, we'd love it if you subscribe to us on the podcatcher of your choice. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, you know, everywhere as ABA Inside Track. You can find us on social media. We're on Twitter and Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. You can find these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling features on. You can find links to all of the articles discussed and a place to find old episodes as well as to purchase CEs for our episodes at our website, abainsidetrack.com. And if you're interested in more ABA Inside Track goodness, why not join us on Patreon, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. We're subscribing for just $5 a month. We'll get you access to our every other month or bi-monthly social meetups. If you'd like to subscribe at our $10 level, you'll also gain access to our extra long book club podcast, each of which is worth to learning credits, as well as discounts at all levels for in our CE store and other little goodies and episodes a whole week ahead of time. So if you want to be in the know, check us out at patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. And finally, if you want to reach out with any feedback or thoughts, email us at ABA Inside Track at gmail.com. Big thanks also to the people who help make ABA Inside Track, Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his editing work, and Hollis Irvin from the Sycamore Workshop for his visual designs. Thank you to Jackie and Diana for being here with me. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye!